Please be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Gary, for filling in today. Be in prayer for Micah, Naomi, and little Rebecca and Carlton as they've all traveled to Nashville for the singing conference to uh, grow and learn as our music minister. So be in prayer for them as they're traveling this week for that conference. Appreciate you, Brother Gary, and uh, appreciate the prayers for my back. If I collapse and fall on the floor, don't worry, I can preach from the floor just as well as I can from the pulpit, so it's okay. More comfortable for me, more awkward for you, but you know. <laughs> Several weeks ago, we had a lady come into the office. Uh, it was near the end of the day. She came in and said she wanted to talk to me about something that was going on in our community. So uh, Sherilyn was here. We sat down and she would tell us what's going on. And she told us that there was an epidemic of animal abuse going on in, in Hamilton. And she had these pictures on her phone. She'd snuck onto somebody's private property and took pictures of malnourished dogs and uh, rabbits and rabbit hutches and uh, some animals that they had put to death that they just kind of left out in the field. And, uh, you know, not, not the most pleasant pictures to look at, but she's showing me all this. And she's like, can you believe this? Can you believe this? And, um, you know, I, I'm, first of all, very much against animal abuse. We're supposed to rule and subdue the earth and be good caretakers of it, not abuse uh, what God has entrusted to us. But I kind of sat there and was like, what, do you, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm, I'm not sure what you're wanting from me. You know, I asked, have you gone to the authorities? So, oh, yes, they're not going to do anything about it. And so I just asked her, well, what, what is it that you want me to do? Why have you come here today to, to tell me this and to show me this? Uh, because I don't like that kind of stuff, but what, what are you wanting? And she said, I just want to know how so-called Christians can allow this kind of stuff to happen in our community. I said, well, you want the short answer or the long answer? <laughs> and we started to, to, to try to converse with her, and uh, she was so upset and angry about these animals who were being mistreated, and I tried to explain to her, you know, about human depravity and our sinfulness and wickedness and you know the solution is Jesus the solution is always Jesus if you want to know a solution to the problems of this world it is not in your political party it's not in laws that are passed or in governing officials the solution is Jesus but she didn't like that <laughs> she said one pastor had the gall to tell her that he was more concerned about human souls than dogs I said well I agree <laughs> <laughs> she got upset and she left the office saying, uh, you've just made me a stronger atheist. I do not doubt this lady's sincerity. I really believe that she, she cares for these animals and that she is genuinely upset about the abuse that's taking place. And I understand that, that frustration when people mistreat animals. But we live in a backwards society where people become more agitated, angry, and loud when a dog is abused than they do when a baby is aborted. The ethics of our society are just upside down. And we have a society that expresses love in all these different ways, saying we love, we love, we love, but they have no idea what love is because they have abandoned the truth. We cannot have good ethics or proper living if we have abandoned the truth. And that's why we have all this backwards, messed up society that we have with all these so-called good programs that fix absolutely nothing because we've forsaken God. Walking in the truth is vital for us as believers because we live in a world that is filled with lies. We live in a world in that everything is twisted and corrupted and it just, it doesn't work because it's wrong. This morning we're going to be in 2 John, one of the shortest letters, uh, books in the entire Bible. If you want to really feel good about yourself, sit down and read 2, 3 John, Jude, throw Obadiah in there. You can say, I read four books of the Bible in one day, you know, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> Second John, this little letter, 
is a powerful reminder for believers to walk in truth. Because it's only when we cling to the truth of Jesus Christ that we can truly love as we've been called to love. I ask you to pray with me and prepare our hearts for God's word. Heavenly Father, you are a wonderful, merciful Savior. I thank you for sending your Son to be the Savior of the world. That a wretch like me could be called a child of God. Your mercies are never ending. We praise you, Lord God. And we thank you for allowing us to have this time in your presence, to read your word, to sing your praises. But if our hearts are cold and shut off, I know that it will do little for us. So we pray for your continued grace this morning, that you would quicken our hearts to believe, that you would open our eyes to see, Lord God, that you would prepare our ears to hear the sweet voice of our good shepherd. Please, Lord Jesus, call out to us, speak to us, guide us, convict us, lead us, change us. Glorify yourself through your word. Remove the weaknesses of this preacher that you might be glorified abundantly in our midst. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Second John chapter 1, verse 1. John begins by saying, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I want to pause there for a moment as we look at this introduction to this letter. John is really kind of putting out the whole reason that he's writing He's writing very briefly because he's writing to a congregation that he hopes to see soon, that he hopes to explain more about these things soon, face to face. So that's why this letter is so short. Same with 3 John. But he's writing because there's particular problems in this congregation where you have people who have abandoned the truth of the gospel, as we're going to see this morning. And because they have abandoned the truth of the gospel, they are not able to love as they are supposed to love meaning they're not able to fulfill the commandment that God has given to his people. And so John has truth and love hand in hand here. You cannot have one without the other for John. He writes as an elder or as a pastor to this chosen lady, most likely not an individual lady, but a term he's using for the church he's writing to, her children being the church members. And he says, I love these Children, these church members, I love you, and not just me, but everybody who knows the truth. He says, we love you for the sake of the truth or on account of the truth that is ours forevermore. We love you because God has told us to love you is what John is basically saying. The truth of the gospel is that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. And John told us in 1 John that the commandment that God has given us to be saved, to be his, if you want to follow God's commandments, John sums it up in like this. Believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, and love one another. If you do that, you're keeping the commandments of God. This is the truth that has been revealed. And John says, because of that truth, we love you. Because of this truth in which we have been commanded by God to love, that is why we love, not because of situations, not because of benefits that this congregation has been able to give him, not because they are pleasing in his sight, although some of these things may be true for John. The basis of his love is the truth of the gospel. Just real quick, we, we need to have this stated we cannot truly love one another unless that love is founded in the gospel. Because you and I are not naturally loving people, unless it's ourselves, at which point we love to love ourselves. 
We are not naturally loving people. John says we love because God first loved us. And if you don't know the love of God, you're not able to love as God has loved. If you have not believed in the gospel, you are not able to then live out the gospel of love. You see, churches that are cold and filled with hatred and bitterness, I would say that is a church that has abandoned the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love because the gospel is a gospel of love. And so he says that this is what we're doing. He says grace, mercy, peace, wonderful things that our souls desire. Notice, it's not like Paul who says it is with you. He says grace, mercy, peace will be with us from God and from Jesus in truth and in love. Future tense, the grace of God, the mercy of God, in peace with Almighty God will be ours in truth and in love because we've believed in Jesus Christ. In other words, you can have God's grace, mercy, and peace today, but you will also have it tomorrow and the day after and the day after, all the way into eternity come because God has loved you in truth and he has loved you completely. And so John is, is, is beginning this letter by putting all this out here, saying that love is based in truth. Truth feels love. This is why we love and why we can be confident in God's love because the truth of the gospel does not change. It stands forever. So if you abandon the one, you're going to abandon the other. So that's kind of the, the, the introduction, if you will, to this letter. Now to get to the heart of the letter, verse 4, if you'll read along with me, it says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. So John, as he's writing to this church, he says, I, I have this great joy. I've been exceedingly glad to see that some of your children are walking in the truth. That also indicates that there are some children who are not walking in the truth, and we'll talk about that in point two. But he says, these who are walking the truth, they bring me great joy and delight to see them doing this because they are fulfilling the commandment that God has given us from the very beginning. This commandment that Jesus gave in the Gospel of John 13, 34, this new commandment I give you, that you love one another. This commandment that God has given us from Jesus Christ from the beginning, John says, I rejoice when I see people doing it. You know, the, the greatest thing that you can do for a preacher, a minister of the gospel, is to show them your faith. People who truly desire to see God glorify, rejoice when the children of God glorify Him by how they live. John says, I am thrilled to see it happen. But let's talk about what it means to walk in truth. What does it mean to walk in the truth of the gospel? John says that I see these people walking in the truth. They are loving each other just as they've been commanded to. This is love that we do the commandments, that we obey. If you say you love God and you disobey God, you're showing you're not very much in love with God. So he says all this stuff that we've had from the beginning, that we love each other and we prove that we love each other by obeying and we obey so that we can prove we love each other. That two sides of the same coin that we saw in, in 1 John, all of it is coming together in these people walking in the truth. Walking is a metaphor that John likes to use to indicate a lifestyle. A way that you conduct your life day in and day out. Listen to me. If you make a decision for Jesus that lasts a moment and then you go back to what you were doing before, you're not walking in anything that is good. It is not the one-time decision that determines whether or not you're walking in the truth. It is the day-in and day-out decisions that you make that reveal how you are walking in this life. And so if you have a moment of conviction that you say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I'm now yours, Lord, and I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm going to get baptized, and then a month later, you spend the rest of your life living like the devil, you're not walking in anything good. 
To walk in something is to conduct your everyday life in this manner. So to walk in sin means that you conduct your life in a sinful manner. This is what we mean by living in sin. Not Christians who struggle with sin, but those who say, I like it, I'm not going to stop it, I'm going to continue in it day in and day out. You are walking or living in sin. But John says these people are walking in truth. That means that it's more than simply they know the truth. Now, they do know the truth. They know the truth of the gospel. But it's more than that. To walk in it means that your life has been radically changed because of the truth of the gospel. To walk in the truth means that you now have restructured your life to walk like Jesus walked. To live as Jesus lived. To talk as Jesus talked. To be like Jesus. Him. That's what it means to walk in the truth. So let me ask you, has the truth of the gospel affected the way that you live? Has it changed how you behave, how you see the world, how you respond to the world? If the truth has not changed your behavior, all you have done is known the truth, but you have not walked in it. If you're not living it out, and it does you no good. We must walk in the truth. Good theology is supposed to produce good living. Jesus prayed in John 17 on our behalf, and he's prayed to the Father, Father, sanctify them in truth. This does not mean that Jesus wants us, wants us to be merely a doctrinally pure congregation. We are supposed to be doctrinally pure. We are supposed to hold on to the truth. And we're going to talk about that in just a second of what happens when you don't hold on to the truth. We are supposed to cling to the truth, proclaim the truth, stand for the truth, be the people of the truth of the gospel. We are supposed to do that, but we are not merely to be doctrinally pure. When you go to the book of Revelation, the very first letter that Jesus sends to a church, you never want to be the first one because that's like the most memorable, that or the last. Neither are very good in Revelation. He says, you've done well. You've chased out all the heretics. And you have stood for what is true. You have maintained doctrinal purity. But I got one thing against you. You left your first love. And Jesus says you need to repent of that one thing or I'm coming to wipe you out. It's a pretty serious issue for Jesus that they had left their first love. Doctrinal purity that just stays there is not glorifying to God. He wants his people to be so affected by the truth of the gospel that it changes everything. It changes the way that we live. That's what it means to walk in the truth. Jesus said that he came to set us free. That the truth is what sets us free. And it sets us free from sin. That means that when we hear the truth of the gospel, that we begin to change the way that we respond. Because we know the truth of the gospel. That God has forgiven a sinner like me who does not deserve it. It means that when our spouses attack us, we forgive them. Because in truth, we've been forgiven of far more. It means that when our employers mistreat us, we forgive them. Because in truth, we've been a very bad servant to our God. It means that when we sin, we recognize the truth of the gospel that we didn't deserve God's forgiveness and so we go to others and ask for their forgiveness because we don't deserve it. We recognize the truth of the gospel and it and changes the way that we live. And to put it all together into John's language, we begin to sacrifice ourselves to love other people. We begin to sacrifice ourselves for their good. Not out of some altruistic idea of just trying to help the world, but because we have been loved by God in truth. The truth of the gospel is that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, not deserving 
of his love, mercy, grace, or forgiveness. Christ died for us. He demonstrated love in dying for his enemies, of which I am the foremost. That truth should change the way that I treat you, my wife, my family, my neighbors, my friends, my enemies. It should change everything. Walk in truth, Christian. The truth is meant to set you free, but it only does when you choose to walk in it. But we live in a world that is filled with lies. And it makes it difficult. That's why we must be on our guard against the lies of this world. If you'll continue reading verse 7, we'll see that not all were walking in truth. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. We saw this in 1 John. John talked about there are those who went out from us, but they were not really of us. There are these people who in the first century were professing Christians who left the gospel message behind and they went out in order to deceive and take captive other believers with their false ideas. They were probably sincere in their thought process in their rejection of Jesus' coming in the flesh is what John is talking about. And their rejection of Jesus as God as we've seen also in the first century and second century. You, you see these people who are sincere in their beliefs that Jesus is not who the Bible says He is. And yet they are so insistent that other people believe like they believe. And so they would go out into the church to convince people in the church to leave the gospel, the teaching of Christ, and to follow their way. John says these people are the antichrist. They're the deceivers. They're the ones Jesus told were about that they were going to come. And so he says you need to stay away from these people. You need to not welcome them into your house. You need to not even greet them. And some people have looked at this and said, well, John is he's being pretty harsh here. I mean, you're saying to have a total rejection of those people. We live in a world that says tolerate, embrace, accept. And John says, no, don't do it. Because if you do, if you show any acceptance for that person who is standing against the truth of the gospel, John says, you are participating. Literally, you have fellowship with their evil deeds. You become guilty when you accept the heretic. It is not hateful for a parent to tell their child to stay away from the snake's den. It is not hateful for a parent to snatch their child out from in front of a moving car. And it is not hateful for a pastor to sell his people, stay away from the heretics. Don't even greet them. Because they have abandoned the teaching of Christ. He says that they have gone too far. That word in verse 9, anyone who goes too far, uh, it simply means to run on ahead of somebody. He says they've gone too far. And what that means is if you've gone too far, you've left behind the gospel. And we live in a world in, the, in which people believe, truly believe, that they have outgrown the simplistic message of Christianity. They have outgrown the gospel. It's nothing new today when people believe that. You had Islam. In which Muhammad said, oh yes, Jesus, a wonderful prophet. 
But the Christians messed it up. So I had to correct what they messed up. You had Joseph Smith with the Mormons saying, oh yes, Jesus, uh, a son of God. But they messed it up. I had to correct what they messed up. You had the whole enlightenment thinking saying those Christians are just out of date and we have become too enlightened to fall for that simplistic idea of the gospel. And so they correct things and they change things and they outgrow things. They outgrow the gospel. They go too far. But when you go too far, you've left behind the only source of truth that there is. There are just certain things that you don't outgrow in life. Personally, I don't know about you, I will never outgrow Legos and lightsabers. Because <laughs> Legos, come on, they're awesome. You can build whatever you want with them. I've still got my old tub from when I was a kid up in my attic. Never going to get rid of that thing. Unless God causes the house to burn down in which I will weep. <laughs> you never outgrow it. You might think, you're, oh, I'm too mature for that. But come on, let's, if you're honest, you sit down alone. There's nobody to see you and you can play with some Legos. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Lightsabers, look, Disney may have ruined the Star Wars franchise, but lightsabers are still cool. <laughs> They're still lightsabers, right? It's okay, that's not my cup of tea. I've outgrown all that stuff. Well, good for you. There's some things that just none of us outgrow. For instance, your parents. If your parents are still alive, you will never outgrow your parents. And it is hilarious to me to watch a 90-year-old woman mother her 70-year-old child. <laughs> but it happens because to that woman, that will always be my child. You never outgrow. You never mature past that relationship. And yet we live in a world that feels like it's okay to outgrow the gospel. That it's okay to move past the truth. And John says, no, it's not okay to do so. Because if you run past the gospel, then you run into lies. This is why he says to stay away from it. He's not saying stay away from those who are struggling with their faith. He's not even saying, don't share the gospel with those who have it wrong. He's saying these people who know the truth and have abandoned the truth and are trying to convince you to abandon the truth have nothing to do with those people. I can go talk to the Muslim and share Christ with them in a good conscience. But to allow somebody who knows the truth, who has abandoned the truth, to come in here and speak to you, I should be fired for that. I don't care what acceptance we have in our society. You don't accept poison into your body. John ends his letter by saying, though I have many things to write to you, I don't want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister, the congregation he's writing from, greet you. And I think it's very interesting. He ends his letter with a greeting. He says, don't greet, don't even greet these people. But you who are walking in truth, we have fellowship. Bound together by the gospel message. There's a lot of lies out there and a lot of ways in which our society and our world and even in the church, we have tried to mature past the Bible. A lot of it really centers around ways to excuse our immorality as Christians. And we say, well, you know, we know better now. Jesus loves everybody, you know, so we don't need to be so harsh on certain lifestyles or so staunch against certain practices. It's the reason why Christians are embracing homosexuality when it's one of the things that God says so clearly is against his design. Well, that's just old-fashioned thinking. <laughs> it's what's led to rampant divorce rates in our church because, after all, God wants you to be more happy than holy, right? It's what's led to the epidemic of pornography among our men and even women in our churches. 
It's the kind of thinking that allows for whole families to be destroyed and yet still say, oh, we love the Lord and we serve him faithfully. After all, Jesus wants me to be happy. We have devised whole ideas, whole ways of thinking that have gone past the gospel because we're enlightened now. We're smarter than they were then. We're more advanced than they were then. Our society is better than their society was. Beware of lies. These are lies. The gospel is the truth. Jesus is the truth. And if you go past him, you've gone into darkness. If you go past him, you've fled away from life into death. There's no truth outside of God's truth. Walk in the truth. Let it change the way that you live. And Christian, be ever so careful about the lies that surround us. Do not let them take your eyes off of Jesus. And do not let them convince you to run on ahead, leaving Jesus behind. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you because your mercy and grace is great. You know our hearts and how we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. Forgive us as your people and sanctify us in truth that we would walk in it in all of our ways. Lord God, make our path straight and give us the wisdom to discern the lies that we are presented with every day that we might continue to be sanctified in truth every day. Make us a people of truth and love that we might be honoring to you, glorifying to you, that we might be pleasing in your sight. And Lord, I pray especially for the one here this morning who is struggling. Maybe bad lifestyle choices, maybe sins that they've tolerated, or maybe they don't even know you. Lord God, I pray that you would speak to their heart right now and that they would listen and that they would turn to you and find the life that you have to offer. Grant them faith and repentance, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close into our invitation time, you know, Christian, there's so many ways that we allow the world to dictate what we believe more than we allow the gospel to dictate what we believe. So many influences that we allow to penetrate into our heart while remaining steadfast against the gospel message. Why do we fight it? Yeah, it's easier maybe to live in this world tolerating things. But this world is destined to perish. This world is destined for the flames and everything in it and all that it holds and all of its philosophy and worldview and mentality. It's all already has its day set by God. Christian, God calls us to come out of Babylon and to walk in the truth. So my question for you is, in what ways have you ignored the truth of God in your life? In what ways have you turned a cold heart and said, no, I will not let God affect that area. I will not let him affect that relationship. I will not let him take away that joy. I will not, I will not, I will not. All you do is cling to death. Let us be a people of life, a people of love. We cannot be that unless we are a people of truth. Walk in the truth. Maybe for you, though, 
Maybe for you it is a matter not of simply surrendering further to Jesus, but surrendering to the first, for the first time to Jesus. I don't know where you are. I don't know what your life has been like. I don't know what your struggles are. I, I don't know if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim not to be a Christian. But I do know this. Forgiveness, grace, mercy, peace with God, these things are only the possession of those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And not like the demons believe that Jesus is the Christ. But believe like Thomas who said, my Lord and my God. Believe like the apostles who said, do whatever you want. It's better for us to obey God than men. To believe like the martyrs who said, take my head, throw me to the lions, burn me at the stake, do whatever you want to me. Jesus is mine. And I will know no other. It is that kind of faith that grants the life that we want. If that's you, I encourage you to come and speak with me. We'll have a deacon standing at the back if you need to talk with somebody for a long time. You can have grace, mercy, and peace. It will be yours if you surrender your life to Jesus today. Stand with me and let us sing our song of invitation.